Okay. Special meeting to order for November 4, 2014. Uh, Alex, will you give yep. blessing? All right. Our dear Heavenly Father, the Lord, we ask that this meeting and it has been brought to order may be under their, thy guidance and care and thy blessing that those things which are necessary may be successfully achieved and that they may be in accord and in all necessary matters and that that which is for the welfare, for the benefit of our city and our community may receive thy approval, thy blessing, and be a benefit to all, both those who are doing well financially in good shape and those dear Heavenly Father who at this day may stand in need for we know that the uh, that the costs and expenses of many exceed that which they currently are receiving in this day in which we experience inflation which has carried some beyond their ability to succeed well. So we thank thee and ask that those who, who are present may be uh, in agreement for all that would benefit us and maintain us on a pathway to prosperity, to comfort, and the resolution of all our needs. For we ask this in thy Son's name, Jesus Christ. Have any changes to the agenda? We cannot change since it's a, a okay. special meeting. We have to go by the agenda. Okay. Approve the consent agenda. The regular meeting of 10-21-14. Approve the minutes for the workshop. 10-27-14. Approve appropriation ordinance 11-3-2014 in the amount of $8,519.35. Approved appropriation ordinance 11 4 2014 in the amount of $98,698.34. Approved the use of the skating rink for elementary PE 10th through the 9th, 12th through the 15th, from 9.25 to 11.25 each day. Appropriation ordinance 11 3 14 for solid waste and the rest of those. I hear motion. So moved. I hear second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I vote. Yeah. Administration, Mr. Chesbro. Okay. Skating rink. I still do not have anything to report. I've called these people again on getting a price on the floor. In fact, I've made it a point to ask the other company to have said they were interested. It says, if you are not interested in it, please say so. So, oh yeah, we're going to get you something right out, got an email, back to the room, nothing. So, uh, I did get, you know, and I guess the direction of, of which we're going to look at, you know, we looked at just coding the floor, if we're going to do anything else, uh, we just looked at redoing the carpet on the walls, you know, and tried to have it just clean, and maybe putting up a handrail, and, and uh, putting up a different 
style of carpet. You may bring for the carpet, but what I'm going to be for going to be some echo in there that's you know, we're going to keep up something probably on the walls and similar to that. So well, I'm sure we can go a different style of carpet. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, I've got a price on all that, but I think we're probably going to look at something like that. I talked to John about it as far as finding some We're not getting any response. I don't know why I specifically asked for that. Is that a uh, flooring company? No, it was one of them was a contractor that did the work on the school. And then it was a company that uh, does the skating rink. Uh, we buy supplies from the shoe laces and all that other stuff from them. They do that kind of work, or they have something there. I've talked to this three or four times. I don't know what to say, but I think we're going to try to this. One company I talked to took the information and they didn't get surprised. I mean, it was one of what they wanted to do for a couple of years. That's all I can say. We're going to keep trying. I'm going to see if we can get someone else to another company. Well, yeah, I don't know if he does that or not, honestly. I really thought about him as far as he might. Uh, as far as the rest of the work, I don't know if that's what he's going to do. Yeah, that's a good thought. I'll say if he's actually doing a try, I don't know. Okay. We'll see along those lines. Yeah. Like I say, it's not a work, I guess, if you want to proceed.
2013 figures, that's just strictly the officers and their direct expenses. Is that correct? And that's total for the whole year? Yeah. And the other one is just the current date? Year to date. The 2014 is with five payrolls remaining to go. Right, but what was the total when we had four officers? 
back to those years. And well, how's there a way to compare it? Right. Because otherwise we ain't going to have anything to compare it to other than wages went up or whatever, so it's more expensive this year than it was last year. I mean, that ain't telling us nothing. Between three and four officers. Yeah, I can only see on there. The only thing that would disappear for officers was standby to pay and overtime for a total of right. near 11,000. Right. As long as I'm in, there's really no need. I mean, you can't really compare it. I mean, I know right. that, I know these will be higher because of wage increases and, right. mm -hmm. and it go the time delay between when it was and now, but at least it give you somewhat of an idea. It's better than this because there's nothing to really compare to. I don't know how many years it'd be since Sunny. You go back to when Sunny was here, mm -hmm. and probably a couple of years prior to yeah. when he was more on duty. We'd like to research it some more. Apparently. I mean, I guess the only other thing is if you could do an estimate. I think the what, numbers are there. We just have of to what back four to officers? I mean, like take year to date on 2014, the three officers, and then do an estimate of the same time if they had had four officers, incurring their expenses and minus whatever they think they would miss. You know, like you're like you're saying the call time and the overtime and some of that stuff that would disappear off. I, I, wanted to, I mean, because you got to have something to compare it to. I wanted to pull it apart more like three officers versus two and leave Adam's salary position clear out of it. Because his is the same all the time, no matter right. what. Right. But I don't know if I can do that. Well, she could do the same thing. Yeah. Don't she, could, she could take Adam's stuff out of the year to date, which would just be figuring Aaron's and Charlie's. But I think you need to compare their scheduling too, right. as well, because the, the hours worked are going to be different when you have four versus three. Looks to me like there were 310 hours of overtime from 1 1 of 2013 to 12 31 of 13. Am I looking at that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and that was overtime paid as overtime. This 47 above it uh -huh. is. Uh, like if they would have taken had sick leave dur or a vacation during that week, they would have been paid at a regular rate. So there was 47 hours that were paid at a regular rate instead of overtime rate because they had leave during that 40-hour period. And what's the 72 other miscellaneous pay? That's their um, uniforms. Associations with them officers, them cost, and then do the an estimate. Okay. 
Okay, when you say all those associated costs, do you mean? Like the uniforms, everything. Because, I mean, that's what's going to have to be added. Okay, anyway. I think this is something probably we need the chief to do. Okay. And we'll give the information for payroll, and he can add up what he has for his other costs. Yeah, and then, and then do the same one as if we had four officers instead of three, and that way you'd have a comparison because then whatever you would lose as far as your overtime and all that other stuff would be off, and that way you have a more accurate between differences, if that's what we're trying to find out. Actually, I mean, if you don't mind to give me an example of how, how it would be effective. Is my wife had a, a death in her family. Adam's out of town. The funeral's tomorrow. I have to work. So I can't even go support my wife, which I could if we had the fourth officer. I mean, that's, that's, you can't figure that by money. Right. You know, I mean, that's, it's just one of those things. Right. Well, it's just saying I just don't want any of this to create a hardship. You know, for any of our officers, and just to backfire on us, so to speak. Um, I just want this to be as painless as possible for for y'all's pocketbook. Is what I was trying to say. Yeah. So, and uh, you have you have my sympathy. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you just want us to approve this SMS tire in that police department? Yeah. Can you approve it? I'll call Marshall and get him ordered. Uh, move, move to approve the. Uh, What's it for? I mean, I know it's tire. For the for the Dodge, the pickup. Okay. All yours. Thank you. This wall, this wall on the side, and then on the other side of the cabinet. Don't let them in either, so. 
It's wages for an employee. Okay. That's the subject. We need a motion for a 10-minute executive session for non-elected personnel. So moved. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Looks like you got a package today. I'm trying to buy a half a load of poles. Um, we really don't like to buy over 20 or 25 at a time because sometimes we don't get them in the air fast enough. And the way it is, I've got I've got five left on the rack, class 440s, which is what we use the most of. Two of them are shell rotted completely. They're completely junk. They've been there too long. One of them's really crooked, and I've got a chance to split a load with somebody else. I'm not sure who the other city is, but we split the freight and that stuff that way, and the cost for a half a load. I think there's 23 poles in there with, what was it, 78, 36, and some change or something like that. It's about $340 a pole. That way we share the freight and, and that stuff, and they, they usually come within two weeks. I've got about um, twelve dollars or $13,000 in my pole transformer and cross arm budget, I think, for the rest of the year. So there's enough money in there to cover it. 
So I need a motion to approve purchase. So yes. moved. Second. Do we have a a, a number? 7836. 7836 and some change. I didn't bring my sheet, but I, I thought the council had a sheet. That's a guaranteed price so long as they get the other. If they don't get the other half sold, the other half a load sold, we won't take them. Because I won't, I won't buy just a half a load because the freight's just twice as much, you know. So we split it or won't take it at all. So. Okay, so the motion would be to purchase the poles at a cost not to exceed 7900 provided we can get a full load put together. That's all I've got. I'll bring the uh, approving alcohol measurement. Yeah, bring the whole deal, would you? This is just a candle. Maybe we can get a discount rate for that. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Don't worry about it. Okay. All right. Just go ahead. I included, I had John include with your packet some information on uh, land banks that I just I brought up during the last meeting. Um, this came about because the city has a piece of property um, that was <coughs> talked about in previous meetings and wanted to know if the city had any ability to control what happens to that piece of property, meaning is it used for residential, besides your, your zoning regulations, um, you know, what could happen to that piece of property. Sometimes, um, and I don't know, because I haven't been here that long, whether you guys have abandoned lots around St. John or, or pieces of property that uh, ad valorem property taxes aren't collecting on, haven't been paid. The uh, city goes in and mows the grass once in a while and, and, and tries to collect against that landowner. This, this would set up a, a mechanism where that piece of property could be donated to the city by an MCD landowner to the land bank. Um, the land bank can then decide what to do with that piece of property. It sits in the land bank until the city decides, uh, well, not the city, the, the trustees of the land bank for all intents and purposes could be the, the city council, but until the, that group decides what to do with the property, whether sometimes they sell it to an adjacent landowner who could use it, um, sell it to, uh, or give it away to a family wanting to relocate to St. John or a business wanting to relocate to St. John. So it allows a little more flexibility um, in controlling those types of pieces of property. This, this I, I provided uh, what was at one point a PowerPoint presentation we had previously prepared for another city and I provided um, a copy of some just draft policies that a um, land bank could use. Uh, and then I provided a copy of an ordinance uh, and again, this just for informational purposes, if this is something you guys want to do, it's not really, it's not on the agenda for the adoption of, it, of an ordinance today, but uh, information provided for the city council review, and uh, we can talk about it or do something with it some other time. While that property is in the hands of the, of the land bank, does it have to, it'll have to pay all the taxes and nope. all that other, or not? Nope, uh, by state law. No, there's, the, no. there's no ad valorem property taxes would be owed by the city. The, the so like it, say some of these sheriff's auctions or whatever, if the property only brings 50 bucks or whatever, they could, that land bank could purchase that, that and put it in the land bank and not pay taxes on it and then decide what to do with it? The city could give the land bank operating funds, land bank then could buy that lot. And I know, and sometimes, you know, in Pratt County, they'd go for you know, a dollar or whatever, just right. just to get rid of it. Um, the other thing is, as your as land bank gets up and going, it sells lots, sells property or, or whatever, 
um, that money can then be retained by the land bank to buy more property. So it gives it gives the city the op the, the ability then to kind of it kind of, as almost another zoning type regulation to decide okay we want to use this lot because it fits better with this neighborhood as a residential house um, to incentivize somebody that wants to move to town we will give it to somebody who relocates to St. John. Um, but I noticed when I was doing some stuff um, for Reno, looking at Reno County's website, that Hutchinson has land bank, and you can go and you can click on the land bank on their website and see addresses of pieces of property in the land bank. Um, Greensburg did it because uh, they had a number of people move out after the tornado and who were just wanting to turn over their lots to uh, the city of Greensburg, so they started a land bank. Were we to do something like this, it would lend itself very nicely to um, working cooperatively with the Economic Development Board in them securing grants to build duplexes, multifamily housing, that type of thing. It would give us the ability to let them build on the land and then sell it and do whatever. And, and you could, one of the things is you could do you know, sell it for so much money, and if they stay there for a number of years, refund or rebate that money. I mean, it, it can really be worked out a number of ways. Um, a lot of times in these situations, there are adjacent properties, you have a house that burns down and the land just gets abandoned, and then the city's left cutting the grass or whatever, burning tires up and that kind of thing. And so you want to put that land to some use, bring it back on the tax rolls. Um, this kind of creates that connection that allows you to do it. Well, I, I read through that. I think that's something you ought to consider. And it may, be, it may take some time to get up and running. And, and it, frankly, if there's no land in it because it's been successful and you've, got, you've sold the land or given it away, then, then it's always there for well, when, the, when it comes, when it's needed. Is there a fee or of any kind on setting that? As far as the state of Kansas is concerned? No. no. In setting up the land bank, there isn't any kind of... Um, I, 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 you know, I'd, I'd have to look to licensing see... Licensing Not a licensing. There may be, like, an accounting IRS type issue. I'd have, I'd have to look to see um, whether it would need its own tax ID number and that kind of thing. I don't... I don't know because that would have been something I've handled in the past. But I could check to see how some of the other cities would it need to be set up with the 501c3 designation? It, no, it should it shouldn't it shouldn't need to be. No, it is a creature of statute. I agree, I think it's something that would be worth our while to pursue. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we could have that nice brand new duplex sitting somewhere here in town instead of in Maxville. I think that's the reason they went that direction is because they had a lot accessible where we didn't. So. If somebody wanted to give a piece of property to the land bank, could it be used as a taxable write-off? Um, I really don't know. Like, in that, that gets the kind of accounting stuff that I don't... You would I, think they could by, um, if it was a reasonable appraised value, you know, you couldn't inflate the value to be... Right. Yeah, right. Is this a tax donation? I mean, I don't see why not, but, um... I think as long as the city was willing to issue a letter back to the donated individual stating that, you know, this is the appraised value of the property and the city acknowledges the receipt of this gift to the land bank or whatever, I think you would be able to use that for tax purposes and write it off. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be honest, how this happens a lot of times is the, the city will cut the grass over entire summer and, and, and typically the city passes along those expenses to cutting the grass or maintaining the land and that person no longer lives here, they inherited it or they moved out a long time ago. And so um, the city 
starts to write letters saying you owe us six hundred some dollars, we're gonna to try to collect one of the options available to that person is just quit claim the land to the land bank and we will forgive that money. I think it's sure something to look at. And we can talk to the accountants about whether no that can be tax on way that I drafted the, just the example ordinance is that the council would be the trustees. And so the first step would be to adopt the ordinance. And then as, and this can be, it's, it, you're still subject to the same open meetings, open records, rules as a governing body. Um, but that, then you become a land bank, and the land bank just needs to adopt policy. And again, I, I took liberty and drafted some draft policies of what that would look like. I, I can't remember whether the policy, sometimes the, pol the policy that I gave you contained some uh, sometimes they go as far as establishing what like a vacant lot would sell for the world. what applicants need to do, uh, what applicants need to give you property, you know, that kind of thing would have to be adopted. So once that's adopted, policy is adopted, the land bank is required to provide an annual report, such as this, this is what we've done, properties are sold, properties are taken in. But uh, you would not really need to meet until there was a piece of property. It's not uh, something that, like I said, there's no property in land bank. It's there for when there is property, other than the end before. So, uh, ordinance and then a meeting to adopt policy. If we, if we set it up to where we were like the, the land bank trustee, trustee. trustees, and we set it up, if, if, at a later time, can we always change it to where we do a, where we set up a land bank trustee committee sure. or whatever? Sure. There's no big deal about doing that later right, on right. or at any point. And people who are, you mean outside of the, the council? Yeah, so you take some individuals out of the community and put them sure. in charge of that. Sure, absolutely. And everything they would decide would still have to come through here, basically. No, it, it operates separately. So they could make decisions without the city council's approval? They could make decisions. You guys decide if, if money goes to the land bank. But they operate independently. And sometimes, whether, and I don't know if, if in bigger cities, whether it's then members of the business community, members of economic development, you know, they, you kind of, they can choose. Um, I put the council there just because, you know, sometimes in a small community, it's always the same people involved right. in the same thing. Yeah, would there be a set of bylaws and so forth that would go with that? Um, Thank you. 
almost three pounds. Uh, but then that you're getting to the point where you're, you're broadening out what right. the use of the land bank is, but if, if ever necessary.
Well, yeah, I'm I not opposed to doing other <laughs> other deals, but I just I don't think we can promote it. But he, Julian was gone, but I think Adam said he had two more traps ordered. Yeah, I know he ordered two weeks ago, yeah. so he ought to be all over. Are you catching a lot of them mail down there by Anna Menaces? And the The police have to set some traps out, and I know the one skull gas been eliminated down there. Uh, I, do, I do know that they would have set some more traps out. So. I had a principal when it was off the weather gets colder. Maybe we ought to look at a chain of doors. <laughs> I think that would be opening a huge can of worms that we really don't want to get into. Because that means that anybody can discharge a weapon for any reason. I don't think that we can. Because how do you determine somebody says they were shooting at a stray cat or a skunk? And, oh my goodness, it ricocheted and landed someplace it wasn't supposed to. And, gee, I'm sorry. So. Okay. Um, are we, have we covered the scopes? <laughs> City code. I put a few things in your uh, packet. And I think we're not, I think it would maybe be most pertinent to just as we gather the information there's still some things we're working on i've sent some things back uh, to city code to be working on they've updated the draft online and uh, there's a few things we're still waiting on but i think maybe we just need to wait till we have them all ready now we do need to decide to do what you're going to do with the the um, liquor laws and the CMB. We visited briefly about that yeah. during the workshop. We visited with, uh, with Dillon's, and it doesn't really matter to them one way or the other. Um, all it's really going to do is just level out their sales if it was to be adopted. Uh, most people buy their um, their beer on Friday and Saturday, which increases their sales on alcohol that day. Those two days, if you were to allow it on Sunday, it would just level out, so it doesn't really make much of a difference to them. So, I'm of the opinion that we just leave it as is. On the Sunday sales. On the Sunday sales, yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? It's logical to me. The only one that affected on beer, three, two beer sales. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now the other one that we were looking at, uh, where the statutes had changed since we codified, was the on the liquor, which would involve squeaks and gillies, whether we wanted to charge a licensing fee through the city. The state already does, but if the city has the right, I guess, to say if you want to do a licensing fee, and the specifics were in that handout that you got earlier. Yeah, I really don't see what we need to. I mean, no. we charge them a commercial electric rate. I think that would be good enough. Mm -hmm. So the council is of the consensus to just say the way it is. So all those things, I'll let him know that, and then when we we don't have to to make motions on each and every one of those changes. When he has it all done, you'll make a motion to approve with the codification. So it'll just be one motion. There is that charter ordinance, but again, we can do that at the same time. Okay. Okay. Um, would anyone like to take a short break before we start the open meeting at training? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. We're going to take a five-minute break. Go. Okay. amendments to the to the act. So those are the last two amendments that were made. Okay, uh, before you get too much further into it, yeah. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and for the, those of you who haven't had to suffer with me before, uh, 
I'm Larry Bear. I'm one of the legal staff at the at the league, going on my 14th year there. Uh, came from uh, 20, nearly 25 years of private practice in, in Harvey County before I went to, to Topeka. I spent about 15 years of that as a city attorney for the city of Halstead and also representing some other quasi municipal boards. So, been a few things. I, Nicole and I have been doing the open meetings, open records presentations for the last few years, the last couple years. Uh, I'm all, my, my wife is a, is a former city clerk of 17 years, so I, I have sympathies with, with city clerks and biases to small towns because I grew up in one and represented one so that's kind of the the philosophy that I come into this this type of presentation with is that we're we're sympathetic to the to the world and uh, the un unfortunate or unfortunate thing is is that uh, it doesn't matter what size you are the open meetings act applies to you and uh, I know you're going to love this. We're going to start tonight off with a test. I hope I brought enough. <laughs> if not, Bob can take mine. Yeah, well, you can. Well, you can. Head them around the table there, and take about three or four minutes to for each of you to run through there and circle true or false, and uh, and go from there. And then what we'll do the the rest of the night is we'll we'll kind of cover some of that material as we as we go through things here. To those of you who have heard me speak before, I'm sorry. Uh, to the rest of you, you know, some of the stuff I talk about won't, won't be old ground. So. This one only had one side. I see. Oh. Okay. Well, it's not meant to be easy. Oh, it's not easy. easy. <laughs> <laughs> we've, oh, seen, you can get we've already Mine established the honesty <laughs> in this group. We need another one over here. Yeah. yeah. Mine started at eight. You started at eight. Somebody's got the original. Yeah. Somebody has. Uh, if you've got. Somebody's got the starts at one and ends on. And, and ends on seven, and somebody else has eight and starts goes through fifteen. You've got the original, but that's okay. There's there's the full the full thing. I didn't I didn't give you the sheet sheet, so you. <laughs> 
So we, we only tested half of your honesty <laughs> level. <laughs> Thing is, I'm not going to I'm not going to embarrass you for any any final grade. You will just you're on it's, it's a, you're on your honor to uh, to say, oh, I knew that, but I wonder why I checked the other one. Okay, I give you about another 30 seconds to wrap up there. Since we're not going to really keep score and embarrass anyone. And I'm going to, if you guys on this side of the table want to spin around, I'm just going to kind of use this chair as a podium here because it's easier for me to keep my brains together and all. And uh, like I say, I'm not really going to follow the book. The book is there for your, your reference and use later on. Uh, everything that I talk about comes out of that book. Also, just for your quick reference, there's a section in the clerk's manual that Jonna should have about uh, open meetings. There's also a section in the governing body handbook that each of you should have if, you, or if you've attended the governing body institute and the city gets two sent to it every, every other year. New ones come in. We we revise it every odd year to coincide with elections. So we're we're just ready to do a revision for this upcoming election year. So those are some some quick quick places to find find references in addition to the book. Okay, Kansas Open Meetings Act applies whenever the there is a covered entity and whenever there is a meeting. Both of those terms are defined within the Act. Basically, a covered entity is uh, any legislative or administrative body or agency of the state or a political subdivision that, uh, that and, and that includes boards, commissions, councils, uh, committees, subcommittees, and any other subordinate groups that the that the covered body forms. So, the city council is covered. Any committee or group that is formed by the governing body, whether or not there's a governing body member on it, is also covered by the Open Meetings Act. So, in other words, your library board, if you appoint the members of your library board, they're subject to the Open Meetings Act. If you have a city cemetery and it has a separate board, it's subject to that act. If you have a golf course and you have a golf course board, it's subject to that act. Uh, now, the thing is, is that, okay, what is a meeting? Well, statutorily, meeting is defined, and this is, there's three legs basically three legs to the stool. It's a, a gathering or assembly, and this is, this is, this is words from, from, the, from the statute. 
conducting a gathering or assembly in person or through the use of telephone or any other medium for interactive communication by a majority of the membership of the body subject to the act for the purpose of discussing business or affairs of the body or agency. So in other words, you have to have, there are three prongs, three things that trigger when a meeting is. You've got a gathering of a majority of the body with interactive communication discussing business of the body and we'll get into the definitions of those of those three three concepts as we go here uh, the majority so the basic elements are membership of a, a majority of the membership of the body so when we talk about the body we're talking about your councils so you have five members so a majority of that is three up until eh, three or four years ago we talked about a majority of the quorum which would have been two and we got that massage to be a majority of the body and and we'll talk about why that's that's critical here in a moment with the interactive communication and the discussion of the business of the body uh, when we count for the majority of the body, we count for the the number possible. So if you've got a five member council, five is a number that we always start with, notwithstanding the fact that you might have a vacancy, or you may have someone absent, you may have two vacancies, it's still a majority of the body elect. So we're talking about five is the number that we start from, and three is the critical mass number. Now, this talks about regular voting members. Of course, the mayor and a mayor council form of government has a right to vote in certain circumstances, but they're not deemed to be a regular voting member, so we look only at elected council members or appointed council members. Interactive communication. This is when you're in physical presence of one another or electronic presence of one another. So it can occur at a regular council meeting, can occur at a special meeting, can occur at a work session, staff briefings, telephone calls, video conferencing. It can occur just out here on Main Street, it can occur at the coffee shop. You know. So that's, you know, it's, it's presence in some way and also would include online communication when there's a, some kind of opportunity for contemporaneous exchange I used to use the example so you got the idea of how long I've been doing this is that uh, you know there's no question if you're if if council members are talking on the phone you've got interactive communication if you're talking in person you have interactive communication okay back in the dark ages when we all thought that fax machines were the greatest thing cooking you know, there's a question as to whether or not exchanging things via fax was inter interactive communication my theory on it was the same as it is on snail mail you put a, you put a letter in the mail it goes from one council member to another you know depending upon how graced we are it may be one day it may be three days getting up and down Main Street uh, on things for the most part that probably wasn't interactive communication facts was probably not interactive communication unless the two the two recipients that were involved were standing at their respective fax machines scribbling something on the bottom of each fax as it came through and shooting it back and forth just as fast as as Paul Bell would would handle the situation uh, so you know you've got to look at the circumstance of, of the situation of course chance meetings can can lead to interactive communication and telephone calls whether a conference call or whether individual still still counts online communications yes as long as there's some contemporaneous you know interaction so if I email you and you see it this evening and respond back to me it's probably going to be treated much as if the old snail mail situation 
But if we're sitting here bantering back and forth just as quickly as we can, and this is not as critical now when there's just when we have to have three, a majority of the body is when we used to have a majority of the quorum. If we're sitting here emailing back and forth about the city as quickly as our pudgy little fingers will type, uh, that's probably interactive communication. Particularly if you if you pick up a third along the line. There's no question that video conferencing, uh, instant messaging, if you've got more than two tied in, would be considered uh, interactive communication. So what about the business of the body? Well, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, when we shift, when we shift from talking about fishes, football, and foolishness to the culvert at Twelfth and Main, we've moved to the realm of business of the body. Uh, it may not, it may even be a little more subtle than that. But you don't. Business of the body doesn't require binding action. You know, three of you can be sitting around the table at the coffee shop and and something come up and it can be discussing business of the body. Uh, so just, just the mere discussion of business by a majority of the body would constitute a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Now I, know, I, I should have asked in the beginning, I don't re recall what your faux pas was that, that prompted this get-together. What, what was what uh, what transpired that uh, so that we can cover that in specifics as we go along? Well, the the issue actually was determined by independent counsel to be a non-issue, but basically it was the public perception that there were bathroom dealings going on with okay. regards to uh, property that the city condemned okay. that was subsequently purchased by a council member. Okay. Well, then we don't have any specific executive indiscretions executive that executive session. Yeah, executive oh, session. Yeah, we but no no but there's in that regard we know okay. I, I just wanted to be sure that if we had a specific indiscretion or two that we, we talked about that. Now the the thing to remember is that you know three of you or all five of you could be sitting around the same coffee table talking about, you know, football, fishing, and other foolishness, as I usually say, and there's not a thing going on, but the public, if they walk through the coffee shop, or co-op, or wherever you may be visiting, there's going to be, there's going to be some, you know, some question, and there's some appearance, potential appearance of impropriety there. Uh, you know, can't tell you not to to talk fishing, football, and foolishness, but you know sometimes it's it, you know you may want to um, you know, temper when and where and how those things are done. You know, uh, folks can are always going to be drawing conclusions and passing judgment about your activities, so you can't you know you can't be having to keep one ear to to the sidewalk to see what's going on all the time. Okay. The uh, another another issue that comes about is serial meetings. Up until a, a few years ago, there was these weren't covered by statute. There was an old AG's opinion that talked about the concept of serial meetings, and it really stemmed from a calling tree arrangement. We did not. It, it was our opinion that, that the AG's opinion was, was incorrect simply because it, uh, the, the statute did not address serial meetings. Uh, the, the thing about a serial, and, but the changes to the statute a couple years ago in 2009, it did pick those up. So when a serial meeting occurs with a series of interactive communications, Conducted by less than a majority of the body, and usually this is pro this is done on a one-on-one -on -one basis, where collectively they involve 
a majority of the membership of the body. So you have council member A, talk to council member B, and then talk to council member C, but if you've got a five member council, you're up to that magic number of three. Okay, that has to share a common topic of discussion concerning business of the affairs of the body, and it has to be intended by any one or all of the participants to reach an agreement on a matter that would require binding action of the body. So A talks to B and says, I'm going to propose this, that, or the other, uh, and they talk about it and, and B says, sounds okay, yeah, I can go along with that. And then A talks to C with the same exchange, and but C has no, no knowledge of of A and B's thing, it's immaterial because A is the one that's wanting things to come to a binding position, you've got a serial meeting. So the moral story is, is that you want to, you know, you can talk about issues. You know, A can talk to B and A can talk to C about issues, but you just talk about, we need, you know, we need to, to get the 12th, 12th and Main culvert brought up on the agenda to look at it. You know, there's nothing there about that. But if A says, you know, I want that replaced and I know you'll support it because I will support what you want over here on 2nd Street, you know, then you're beginning to cross that thin ice line. And the, the other thing to remember that the definition uses the term participant, the statute uses, and that refers to individuals that are members of the body. So we're again, we're talking about council members. We don't, doesn't include any third party such as a non-voting mayor, which you, your situation is generally, uh, city manager, city clerk, citizens, city attorney, anybody the you know, utility man, whatever the case may be, anybody along that line. So you, you don't have to worry that, you know, so those people. But serial meetings are something to be, to be cautious of. So overall, so far we've talked about who's covered, the council, the easy way to say is the council and any boards, bodies, committees, etc. That are, that are that you form, and they do not have to necessarily be as formal as you know. You've got a, an ordinance that establishes your your library board, or an ordinance that establishes your golf board, or an ordinance that establishes some other board. It doesn't have to be that formal. The mayor can appoint an ad hoc type committee to investigate something and report back, and they're subject to it. This ad this committee does not have to have a council member on it to still be subject to it. That's where a lot of people say, oh, there are no council members there. That's immaterial. You're subject to because of that broad definition of a covered entity and all sub parts of that. So we, that's who's covered. We know what constitutes a meeting. It's a majority of the body elect with interactive communication regarding the discussion of business of the body without regard to whether or not there's any formal binding action taken. So when we look at what does the Open Meetings Act require then? Because well, first we have to, we've established all of this just to determine what is a meeting and who's covered and that. So Open Meetings Act of course requires open meetings means that they're open to the public. It means that there's no secret ballots or action. The mayor can't call for written ballots. You can ask for voice vote, show of hands, I suppose nod of head if you can, you know, is, is adequate too if you can get a fair count there. It requires notice of the meetings. We'll talk more about notice as we go on. Require, does not require that you have an agenda, but does require if you have one, 
that copies are made available to the persons attending the meeting. Does permit cameras, lights, and recording devices at your council meeting. You can't prohibit those, but you can have a policy regarding the reasonable use and, and location of them. This used to be much more critical before we went to something that size and you had somebody walking around with a suitcase on their shoulder and a spotlight and all of this other kind of stuff. Or they were trying to record it on a on a cassette tape that they only had 30 minute tapes and every 30 minutes they had to jump up and punch in a new one and go that, that route. So so really, you know, that that concept is a little you know, is a little behind us now. Although it does allow you to establish a policy that, that precludes somebody coming right up and sticking their microphone or the camera right in your eye as you're speaking so that you can, you know, there's there's nothing, you can keep that that under control. Okay, so, so every part of a meeting except a validly called executive session must be open to the public. There's no secret ballots or action. It requires notice of the meeting. This requires notice of the time, date, and place of the regular or any special meetings that may be called and it must be furnished to all individuals, groups, or entities that have requested personal notice. Notice by publication is not required and is not adequate to meet the personal notification provisions. You know, public <coughs> There's not a thing wrong with publishing notice, posting it on the city office front door, putting it up on your marquee if you have a marquee, but it doesn't fulfill any statutory duty to give notice. <coughs> Again, uh, an agenda is not required, but any agenda that is prepared for a meeting uh, that, that's covered by the Open Meetings Act must be made available before the meeting to those who request it, but you're not required to mail it to those, only those that are available when they, that are, when they attend the meeting. We've talked about the use of cameras and lights. Okay. A couple of things to keep in mind about open meetings that are not addressed in the act per se. But are, are subject and have been subject of, of, of actions is accessibility. This, the, the statute does not require that a meeting be held in the city hall or any other public building. When I was city attorney, we had a zoning matter that I knew that we knew were going, going to be particularly contentious. Our council chamber was probably about the twice the size of this room and we knew that would not be adequate. The, the hospital had a small auditorium and we moved the meeting to the auditorium to accommodate the folks that would be there. You're not, you know, that's, I'm just saying is that that's not a requirement but it, it may be something to take into consideration because if for some reason you were having something that you knew you would have 35 or 40 people here and it would be impractical for them all to gather in this room and be able to hear you may you may have to relocate uh, it just you know other thing to take in mind is that it you must the facility must be accessible to the public uh, so ADA issues are applicable there uh, an example and, and this was this was a classic example of bad timing. City of Manhattan, and this is oh, probably 10 or 15 years ago. It's been quite a while back. Was was being. You know, this was a precursor to them being sued for ADA violations for failure to to get 
curb cuts and things made in a timely fashion. And they had a meeting, a city a council meeting, regularly scheduled during this time, and they had a number of wheelchair folks that always attended their meetings. Well, for some reason, and I don't, I don't know the exact particulars, but there was a, I think there was an air conditioner glitch that they couldn't hold it in their regular meeting room, and they held it in a, in a another conference room, and and that was fine and dandy, except lo and behold, unknown to them, they had taken the elevator out of service that afternoon. Classic examples of bad timing, on all the way around. But not only did they get were, were they getting slammed on ADA issues in federal district court, they, they were cited for an open meetings violation because they failed to conduct a meeting in a room that was accessible to anyone that wanted to attend. Uh, you know, throw that out. <laughs> for, you know, not, all of, you know, you, not everybody can have that kind of luck all at one time. Uh, the, there are two attorney general's opinions on, on the subject. Uh, and, and these relate to council retreats. And one was several years ago. Uh, it involved a city t doing a retreat in Colorado Springs, I think. And the attorney general's opinion then was, well, while possible for anybody that wanted to attend, it, it really wasn't feasible because for all and therefore it was probably a violation because of time elements of travel, the expense of, of staying and those kind of things. Now compare that to a recent uh, AG's opinion that uh, is almost on point for factual situation and the AG's opinion is, was as well, with proper electronic connections, anyone could attend and it's probably okay. So this one was, this first one was in the late 80s, I believe. The second one was in the last two or three years. So with the advent of FaceTime or Skype or, or some kind of live streaming, you know, it's probably satisfactory because people who couldn't physically be present could still attend and hear what was what was transpiring. So, so I say this is an evolving, evolving package here when we talk about accessibility. Uh, other thing to uh, to keep in mind is that the room shouldn't, you know, however you do it, shouldn't be an inconvenient location or in a room that's so small as to make it inaccessible for for the public. In other words, you know, while the six, well, the Council and mayor could probably meet in a large size broom closet. That would not suffice to to covering the Open Meetings Act and the accessibility issues. So, you know, when we when we talk about notice and ability to to attend, we we talk about a whole gamut of things. Uh, we talked about we've already talked about use of recording devices, and you may not prohibit them, but you can adopt reasonable rules to regulate that. Now we're going to move to the, the notice concept. Uh, the, the act requires notice of the date, time, and place of the meeting. Whether it's a regular meeting, a special meeting, a work session, or any time a majority of the membership of the body is meeting to discuss business of the, of the body. And you're required to furnish notice of that to anyone requesting notice. Now. The statute is silent as to the form of the notice or the timing of the notice. On timing, in a city with a mayor council form of government, you don't have any statutory restrictions. We do have a statutory provision in cities of the second class with the commission form of government. They must give at least two hours notice of a special meeting or, or a meeting but that doesn't impact you all. So we look at the notice, the time of the notice must be reasonable. So when does this, this comes into play when you're having a special meeting, generally. The, you know, because the 
if you have an ordinance that sets out the time, date, or the time and place of your regular meeting, that suffices as notice for the regular meeting. So if your, your, your ordinance or code has, uh, has an ordinance or a section in it that, that provides essentially, you know, the, the council of St. John will meet, you know, on the first Tuesday of each, of each month at 7 p.m. at City Hall to conduct such business as may come before it. That's, that's a notice of the regular meeting. The thing is also that, uh, you know, so, but a special meeting, then you, you would be required to give notice to anyone who has requested notice. Uh, John, do you have anyone that's requested notice? Not specifically. We usually do let Terry know and um, the Shepherd Center so they but there, but if unless you have a written request from them, you're not required to give them notice. Now that's not that that's a good. I don't say that's a good business practice, but by law, you're not required to. I encourage. My thought is is that it's it's much easier to take a few minutes to give notice of something that's going on than it is to spend two or three or four months living with the fact that you didn't and should have. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's uh, cheap insurance. Okay, so the, the, the statute is silent as to when and how. I say we, any time that you have to give notice and, and statutes are silent as to the, a timing frame, reasonable notice is what's required. Now, what is reasonable? Reasonable, in my mind, is like all of us know, not a good good time to do it right now, but if the sun was shining, we all go out and we look, and we can all agree that the sky is blue. But once we start moving off to the various shades of blue, we ain't going to agree. And reasonableness kind of falls into that kind of barrel, if you will. It so you you use it as to you have to look at the factual circumstances surrounding the reason for the meeting. Let's say, for instance, that your water tower has just fallen down. You know, 15 or 20 seconds might be reasonable notice on a call of a special meeting in that, in that regard. If you know that you've got to sign something for bond documents and, and the bond council has called you and said, can we do it, you know, and it doesn't coincide with your regular meeting date, but, you know, and it's several days down the road, you know, two or three days might be reasonable in that situation. So you've got to look at the scenario that you're working with. How do, how do you give notice? Statute's absolutely silent as to that. Uh, in this day and age with most everyone who wants notice having email, that's probably your best method for several reasons. One, you don't have to worry about them answering the phone. Two, you can do it somewhat at your convenience. Three, you have a documented, doc, you're documented showing that you attempted, that you sent them notice. So that's, that's really easy. Not everyone has it. You may have to resort to phone if it's short time. You may have to resort to snail mail if you have more, more time to do that. Uh, what I suggest to folks and there's no, no requirement that you do this. There's nothing in the statute that says anything about this. But that if you have, you know, if you have people that want notice, you ask them to fill out of, you know, your, your notice request form, which you can do, and include on that the method or methods that they would be preferred, that they would prefer to be contacted by. And they give, you know, then they can give you an email address. The other thing is, is that that notice is valid for, for a year. And you can adopt in your ordinances that, that specify that. We suggest that, you know, you, if you've got somebody that's done that in October, if you're doing it on a calendar year, October or November, you just send out to the folks that have that, that 
you know, that their notice is expire and ask them if they want to continue to receive notice of meetings. And if they do, to reply to this to this email. Then you've got it written. You can put it in your in your note in your open meetings notice file and go on about that. Questions regarding notice, as I've plowed about here and run a run amuck. One thing I haven't mentioned. Under the statute, it is really the mayor's responsibility to see that the Open Meetings Act is followed. In practicality, <laughs> it's the clerk that sees that sees that things are done. Uh, so, you know, just to just to throw that out as to you know, that's Statutorily, that's the way we do that. Again, the notice is not required to be in writing, not required to be given in any specific time frame, but should be given in a reasonable time. Uh, as I said earlier on, publication is not required and is inadequate to fill the bill. You know, individual notice is what is required. Now, if you have, let's say you have a group in town, that wants notice, and pick a group, you know, and a, and, and a, a group of activists of some kind that want notice, you can ask that they identify one person to receive notice on behalf of all of the parties that are there and that they share that so that you don't have to, you don't have to ferret out what their membership is and, and get and, and blanket them with, with notices uh, to go from there. Another thing about notice is that if you change, you know, if, if you're having one of those infamous meetings that we've all been to and it's 10.30, it's 11.30 and there's still a ream of agenda to be covered and people are suffering from the, that syndrome, <laughs> uh, you can adjourn this is one time, and technically you're recessing, but the, but the statute speaks of adjourning. You can adjourn the meeting to a time and date certain. So the mayor could ask for a motion to adjourn till tomorrow night at 5 o'clock or 5.30 or whenever people can be, you know, your quorum can be available and move into that. And you're not required to give a notice of that continuance of the meeting if it's done in the fashion of being adjourned to a time and date certain and not just to a time and date that the mayor's to, ch to pick or the clerk's to notify folks or whatever it is. You, you know, so, so really your notice, your, your motion fulfills the notice provisions. Uh, this is a great way to, to do a continuation of an original meeting with no further notice or if you've got a need to adjourn a, a long meeting until the next day or say last week that you met and you wanted to adjourn at seven o'clock so people could go watch the Royals and then you could you could come back the next night and and finish the meeting. You know it's it's permissible. I, again, I'll leave it to someone else to decide if it's good policy. <laughs> uh, but but usually the other place that it's uh, that it's done that that you can do this provision. It, and then this is the way it should be done is that if you're not going if you know it well if you know in advance that you're not going to have a quorum or you get here and you don't have a quorum and you can't get a quorum you can adjourn to a recess to a time and date certain when a quorum will be present and you have to designate that time and date just as before and you don't have to give a separate notice of that so do you call the meeting to order Without having well, a you you simply you can't really call it to order, but but statutorily you're permitted to make that that announcement. Essentially, it becomes and basically it, it requires that you know there be someone from the council present to do that and and all. It's not done very frequently, but it's but it is a way around, uh, particularly this time of year. In 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 this part of the world when we get into football playoff time and and the conflicts of not knowing you know whether you're going to play Tuesday night or Thursday night or Saturday and and all at once 
you know, you're in a football playoff and, and the council meeting is tonight, and you, you can't just hang a sign on the front door and say, sorry, we're gone. Uh, we'll meet some other time. You know, so technically one person has to appear, and, the, and then the clerk should be the clerk also, to, to announce that we don't have a forum present, we don't have a forum, or a quorum, excuse me, can't conduct business, and we're, we're adjourning to, or recessing to, tomorrow night at 5 p.m. when we'll do the regular thing. Otherwise, you have to call a special meeting. And the dilemma when you get into a special meeting is then you're confined to only what the purpose of your call is. So if you've got a regular agenda to handle, and we all know that you can't go through a regular council meeting agenda without there being some other things that, that need to come in, you're, you're locked into your special meeting call. So, you know, that's an option. Don't, don't get me wrong, that's an option. But this other one is, is a little bit easier because two things. One, you're just conducting business as you normally would, and while your meeting should not be a free-for-all, it, it, people are much freer in, in what items that can be brought up, off-agenda items and that kind of stuff. The other thing is, is that it's really under the statute. It's the only way to do it. So we, if we know ahead of time that we're not going to have a quorum, and have you got people out with the flu. And they called, we know we're not going to have a quorum. Is it... Um, Okay, to put a notice on the door saying due to lack of quorum, there is no meeting tonight. Well, you still have to meet and make that announcement. You can't just you can't just post it because the meeting has to be recessed, and the only way it can be recessed is that those you know at least one person, one council member has to be present to make that announcement. So you can't just post it. Now my my theory on it is that you go ahead and you you make you post that. You also notify the folks that would normally come to the meeting that we don't anticipate a quorum, and we're going to, you know, the, you know, those of us that can attend will attend. But we're the only thing we're going to do is move the meeting to a time and date specific, which is going to be X Y Z. Because by then you will have talked to people when they could have could have appeared so that you don't have people trudging in in a blizzard to find out that there's only one person sitting here in the office or whatever the case may be. You know, again, it, it's a kindness routine. So if there's nothing on the agenda that can't wait till the next regular meeting? You can just, well, that, that's when your meeting can be continued to. Or if you've got something that has to be handled, payroll, you may want to do it you know, the next day. You know, you have to look at what what your business is to determine whether you want to bounce, you know, whether you're just going to bounce it down the road to the next regular meeting or whether you're actually going to schedule it on a date and time specific within the next few days. That's usually what's anticipated is that it's done in the next few days. And if, if you get to that place, call us. Look, we'll, we'll walk you through it. I've, I've done it more times than I can, can remember. You know, probably once a month you do it with somebody on something where they say, we don't think we're going to have a quorum, what are we going to do? You know? The other thing to remember about quorums, and this is kind of a little off the topic, but you have to have a quorum before you can convene the meeting, and you have to retain a quorum throughout the meeting, because once, once your quorum is left, your meeting's gone. So if you start with three, and somebody gets called out, or they get mad and leave. You, you know, your quorum's gone, and your meeting ends at that point. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind is that you cannot adjourn just to subvert the the policy of the Open Public Meetings Act. In other words, uh, I, I think where this comes about is that you've got the group that is, is there for a particular reason and you're not wanting to go down that road tonight or whatever the case may be. It's not that you're not prepared to for just for some and you can't just move to to adjourn the meeting till till tomorrow morning at seven o'clock because you know that somebody that wants to be heard can't be here at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. That's that's not that's not kosher. do you know. Okay. All right, a couple things that the 
Open Meeting Act does not require. We've talked about what it's required up to this point. It doesn't require that an agenda be prepared at all. Now, I don't, to me, that's not good policy. Nobody knows you need an agenda for a roadmap to know where you're going, but it doesn't require that it be prepared. And if it is prepared, it doesn't require that the agenda be published. Now, it, it does require that the agenda, that if the agenda is prepared, that it's made available to those who request it and to those who attend it. Uh, and it should include all discussion topics that have been decided in advance. Uh, and, but it may be amended during the meeting to either add something to it that wasn't, you know, agenda, I don't know how you... We you, have additions to agendas yeah. at the very beginning of the meeting. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if sometimes some places their agenda is done Wednesday or Thursday of the week preceding the, the meeting night, and anything can transpire along the line at once, so you can add that to it. Uh, agendas can often often get modified sort of on the fly is that like me being here tonight you've got out of town people that are coming in that you want to accommodate so they can be on the road and they don't need to sit around for three hours of something going on and, and then, so you can ask the mayor can ask for a motion to to move bond council's presentation from you know whenever it is to the to the head of the meeting you know, so that they can be on the road or whatever the case may be. You know, so that's when it's usually used. I, I, I tell people, do not, you know, don't look around the room and see what group is not present that night and say, oh, this would be a good night to take up that subject and a move to a, that's, that's dirty cool, folks. And that's, that's just going to make, make reading in, interesting in the newspaper. <laughs> So, we, we won't go down that road. Uh, okay. If you have agenda packets, the preparation and publication of those is not required. But if prepared, they must be made available to anyone that requests them. Uh, we're, we're talking, we talk to people now about doing their packets in an online fashion for two reasons. One, it saves a thousand trees once or twice a month. And two, if you have someone that wants to see a copy of it, you can simply, if you've got a website, you simply punch it up to them or you can email the whole, whole thing to them. Hopefully they subscribe to an ISP that will, you know, handle a large packet of materials. I'm surprised I still communicate with some people that you would think that would would be able to, and I may have to break something up into two or three smaller chunks to, to get it sent through. But that's the thing. So really, with the packets, the same rules apply as to the agendas. You're not required to prepare them. You just have to make them available to, to anyone that's requesting them. Uh, we, you know, although technically it's, it would be a request under the Open Meetings Act, we would say don't charge people for that because it's going to be voluminous and that's another reason to go online with it if you possibly plan. Certainly don't charge the press for it. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, we get in enough trouble with those guys without without inviting it sometimes, you know. Anyway, no, I'm picking on him, but that's... Uh, okay. The, remember, the general rule is open meetings. However, the Open Meetings Act permits closed meetings, executive sessions is what they're referred to in the, in the statute, in limited circumstances. This is done to protect privacy interests and some other matters. Uh, I think there's 15 statutorily designated ones presently, and your, the topic must fall under one of those exceptions, and the statute requires that there's a proper procedure to be used. The other time that an executive session, or excuse me, open meetings is not required is that when the body that's covered is performing what would be deemed a quasi-judicial function. And, and this, is, this is something that where, where they're doing a fact-finding and applying those facts to something 
uh, akin to what a, a district court judge would be doing. Usually this comes about in planning and zoning appeals and those type of things. Uh, if there's a thought that that may be coming into play, I strongly recommend that the city attorney be conferred with before you run everybody out of the room so you can discuss uh, a quasi-judicial matter. So that so remember, no subject to be discussed at any closed or executive meeting except the following, that's the word down the statute, and then they list the 15 topics. About half of those 15 topics are applicable to cities at some point along the line. Most of the common ones are personnel matters of non-elected personnel, consultation with an attorney on matters protected by attorney-client privileges, employer-employee relationships and negotiations. This is basically if you have a, a collective bargaining agreement, you don't have any unions, that, that's not applicable to you. Uh, confidential data relating to financial affairs or trade secrets of second parties. Some people try to use this as a catch-all. It is not a catch-all. You can't, the fact that you may want to talk about uh, Aunt Mary's delinquent water bill doesn't put you under this provision. Uh, you, you really you're talking about things where you, you've got some kind of proprietary information, some really uh, confidential information that would be applicable to something that the council was considering, such as you know, you've got somebody that's coming to town uh, and you, you really got to look at these close and, and wanting to talk to you about, you know, you know, putting a Casey's in town or something similar to that or something of that nature. And, and they're, they're giving you're talking to you about data that they've developed and this kind of stuff, something that would be of an advantage to a competitor type thing. And, and it's not used very frequently. Uh, again, other topics, the preliminary discussion prior to the acquisition of real estate, not, not the disposal of real estate, but acquisition, uh, Discussions concerning certain types of security matters. Uh, you may be talking about, you know, security of your city building, security of your uh, water plant, something of that nature that you don't really want the world to, to know how you're how you're securing it because that defeats the purpose of securing it. You know, uh, and how do you how do we get to executive session? Well, you got to have a formal motion. <coughs> That's made, seconded, and carried. <coughs> and you recess to to executive session. You do not adjourn to it. The uh, nature of the of the motion is it must include the statutory exception that is being used to close the the meeting. <coughs> it should have a more a more detailed description of the subject matter, and we'll cover an example here in, in just a moment. Uh, and it should state the time and place at which the open meeting will resume. So so your motion might, <laughs> might read something like, I move that the City Council recess into executive session pursuant to the non-elected personnel matters exception to discuss a performance matter involving a city employee. The open meeting to resume in this room at 7:30 p.m. or in 25 minutes or or whatever. So here we've we've done we've set out the the statutory language that permits the executive session, the non-elected personnel exception. We've identified we've used a more explanatory statement uh, to discuss the performance matters of an of, of an employee as opposed to saying. We want to talk about whether we're going to fire John or not. That, you know, I, and you've specified the time and place of the resumption of the meeting. Now, I always get questions on this time to return issue. And number one is I have never been part of an executive session where anyone has had a good guess on how long it should be. That, that's number one. So the other one is is that okay? Should we say 15, 20, 30 minutes, or should we 
designate a specific time. Well, the Open Meetings Act is silent as to this. It simply, it's no help. It simply says, you know, the time, designate the time that the meeting is to resume. My theory on it is, I like to use a spe specific time. Number one is that almost every council room I've ever been in has a clock on the wall, or the mayor has a watch, or somebody at the council has a watch, and you can say, we're going to come back at 8.15 or 8, 8.30. You know, and there's no question. You've set a, an ending. If you say we're coming back in 15 minutes, okay, when does that 15 minutes begin to run? Because I don't know, in your situation, you would probably ask the public to leave the room. So does it does it begin at the time that the motion is made and seconded and voted on? Does it begin as the, as the folks begin to leave the room? Uh, does it begin when they get out of the room and the door is closed? Or if it's a situation where the council has the ability to get up and go to another conference room, is it as you start to move, as you get to the conference room, or is it after everybody's gone by the Coke machine in the bathroom? So I like to use the clock scenario. It's just a personal personal preference. So now what happens is you're in you're in the executive session. Uh, you've you've been there until 8.30. You're still you're you're still not done with your discussion. What do you do? You come back out and you make a new motion, just as you did before, setting a new time to resume. So let's say that you moved it from 8.30 to, to 8.45. Well, at 8.40, you're done. What do you do? You don't come back to the, to the council room and call the meeting to order. You wait until 8.45 to call it to order because you have recessed. For that period of time, you have people that may have gotten up and left gone out to do whatever, not plug the meter, you don't have that problem, uh, but whatever, and they're, they, you know, you, so you, you, so if you finish early, that's when you do the, the Coke machine in the bathroom, and then you come back and, and take up. Uh, so, so when we have the, the motion, the motion should be fully recorded in the minutes to, to cover everything that's, that's stated and should reflect when the meeting, open meeting is to resume. It should also include any persons other than the council who are re requested to attend, because if you're reviewing an employee situation, you probably want the supervisor of that employee involved. Does not you do not necessarily have to include the city clerk because you're not going to take any minutes. Sometimes some places routinely include the clerk, other places do not. If you're doing the personnel matters, I would say city attorney is always there. If you're doing attorney client privilege thing, the attorney has to be there, or the you haven't met the attorney-client privilege thing. The other thing is just because the attorney is present doesn't make an attorney-client privilege. You have to, uh, you know, if you're going to use that, talk to the city attorney simply because it, it has to fall under the statutory definition of what is privileged communication with with an attorney. Uh, so, so you can include that. Uh, the you know, generally only council members and the city attorney or other staff members that may may need to be present are included. Now, if you're if you're looking at disciplining an employee, or or you have a situation where several employees are involved in a disciplinary thing, where you know you've got witnesses, sort of, you know, those people can be brought in and out, you know. Really, the only those that are, are absolutely required for this discussion should be present, but it doesn't preclude you from having others come in as needed. Uh, I have the theory 
that you want to limit the attendance when using executive session because you, executive session should not become a spectator sport. That's not, you know, if you're going to do it in that fashion, just do it out in the open. I mean, for the most part, there is not a thing that requires you to go to executive session on anything. You can do it all in the open. We have the ability to because the exceptions permit us to do that. And there are times when it's in the best interest of the people or, or things involved not to do that. Uh, not not yeah. to interrupt, but you said um, earlier, I don't know, I'm just bringing it up. But, sure. Um, on the executive session, you said something about my, um, somebody not talking about somebody's delinquent bill. Um, can you do that? I mean, can you do that in open meeting and For say sure. names? Sure. That's a public record. Okay. Yeah. There's no, there's no exception. There's you nothing. Know? I mean, there's. But it, there's my no question, exception of name. We can say any name out here we want to. My, is, my question to you, however, is this. And this is from a policy standpoint. We're we're digressing a little, but you're getting another. You're getting an extra quarter's worth for your money here tonight. My thought, for the most part, is why is council concerned about delinquent bills because you should have a policy in place that that has your clerk or your billing clerk you know on top of that and and taking care of that on a regular basis as opposed to the council having to make a decision of that we're going to turn Joe's water off but we're not going to turn Mary's water off to me you know that's that's micromanaging of things that you should have in policy in place that your staff can handle now I, I don't know why you know I may be running down the road too far ahead of you here and I apologize as no, I am. You know, it's just it's just one of those things that, you know, I I know that there are people that want to know. There are some that want to know that have the need to know. And in occasion the the council has a need to know if you are, you know, finance crisis with the city or finance and you want to know in general what do we have for delinquencies, how far behind are people, what is what is you know, what is our billing and our recovery rate and th these type of things. I understand that, but to but for the council to get down to, you know, nitpicking on one or two or three people, you know, to me, I don't. I question whether that's good policy or not. I, I'm not saying that we would, but I was always under the impression you left names that, that you couldn't bring up names and well and delinquency in open meetings. Okay. Say so you have one issue that's a, a problem. Yeah. You just can't bring that up. Yeah. Um, we have a policy that if somebody is behind on their bill and they can, it, it, we have a system in place that they can do a payment yeah. agreement. If they're defunct on their payment agreement, then I no longer have any authority yeah. and it can come to Well, in, in that case, that yeah, and that's, that's, that's fair policy. You know, is that open meeting then? Yeah, there you have. There's no exception that covers that. Okay. There's no now, exception that covers that. HIPAA covers our utility billing information. We are not allowed to give that out anymore. The statutes in that were passed in July of 2013 clarified that for us. The uh, that it, it's under the Privacy Act that under we, HIPAA. Well, I don't know if it's HIPAA or some privacy. Well, act. the thing is, is that the the Open Records Act that was amended two years ago says you shall not give out any information regarding utility billings, addresses, and that type of thing. But it doesn't preclude you from saying, you know, Mary's three months delinquent, and we've got to do something about it. You know, what it does is it keeps the world from using your utility records as a way to find people and the concern really was that was addressed that was addressed too was on domestic violence issues that people were you know using billing records they were obtaining them under false pretense really for another purpose to to find the location of where somebody was living so you know for whatever reason that somebody might request it we're not allowed to give it out yeah you're not required to the, the, We're not allowed to. Yeah, the, the yeah the language is very specific that you do do not have to you do not give it out. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, but you know the the thing to keep in mind on on that is that you 
you know, there if you if there's an exception to the Open Meetings Act that you can fit under, you can use it. But that financial confidentiality one is not does not cover that situation. Now, you it might fall under attorney-client privilege if you're talking about what collection actions you can take and and getting advice on that, you know, you, but you have to pursue that on a case-by-case -case and a fact-by-fact -fact basis as to whether or not it fell, that, you know, that would fall in that. But, but under, say I'd call an executive session over that, under that I'd say attorney-client privileges to talk about Mary's delinquent Well, well you know you would talk about legal strategies for, for bill collection or something of that nature, but okay. you would want, you would want to have everything, all of your ducks in a row before before you ask for that kind of you know before you call for that kind of executive session because you you can you know you can leave yourself in a violation situation you know okay uh, other things okay other questions that come up should minutes be taken absolutely not minutes or any recordings of the executive session become open records and are subject to the Open Records Act, and defeats your purpose of doing the, of going that. Uh, so so let's uh, you know now uh, keep in mind though other questions uh, may more than one topic be discussed in an executive session. Generally, I like to see an executive session confined to one topic. The reason be is that it's harder to to control the extraneous stuff that might be discussed if you do not. Uh, however, if let's say that you're going to do uh, that, you do annual reviews of certain staff members, and you want to adjourn or you want to recess subject to the you know, non-elected personnel provisions to to discuss annual performance review of you know the clerk, the fire chief, and the chief of police, assuming that those are all paid positions that you have. You know, you can you can do that because it's basically a common subject throughout the whole thing. But to adjourn or to recess to talk about the annual review of, of the clerk. Uh, whether or not to hire, you know, somebody, you know, to, to review the, you know, to to review the uh, resumes for the new dog catcher and you know something else. No, that that's it's it's better to do separate ones. There's no limitations on the number of executive sessions that you can go to, in in a during a meeting. So so why confuse the situation on where you're going? Uh, the the one other thing that goes along this line is that okay we've talked about you need to you know limit your discussion to the exception that you've gone in and that you've gone into. However, there are some times when you you may have to. It, it, in the Attorney General's opinion, I think there may even be a court case on this that you can you know to the extent necessary you can go beyond that if it is collateral information is necessary to assist you to reach a conclusion in what you need to do. So let's say for instance that you you start out going in thinking that you're going to you're discussing the annual performance of someone with the idea that it's, it's going to result in in a raise well, and and in fact, when you start looking at it, and, and and I'm going to I'm going to assume some facts, not in not in evidence, as a moment on that, that you you've got it. You use a pay matrix, and you're evaluating somebody, and you want to raise them, but the problem is, is they maxed out. If, are you familiar with pay matrixes, where you've got blocks and you've got steps, and they've maxed out, and you can't do anything about it. So the discussion ends up is that well, we really need to do something to reevaluate. Or pay matrix, that's collateral to what you were doing, you know, uh, and you're not, you know, so you're probably okay along that route. Uh, so again, 
I um, this is my personal opinion is that you should only limit your a meeting to uh, you know to one exception, or or use only one exception or or one one thing. Uh, question is, may we take a vote? No. However. Because no binding action shall be taken during the closed or executive session, and such recess shall not be used as a subterfuge to defeat the purpose of the act. That's out of the statute. Now, it while it doesn't allow you to, to take a vote, it does allow a consensus or kind of a, a nodding of the head or something. So so the mayor could say, okay, if I understand where we've been, if a motion were made something like people would be, you know, you, we could live with that. And you can get a nodding of the head, kind of a straw poll type thing. But you've not, you know, any final binding action has to be done at this table in the open meeting. And so when you come out from the executive session, usually it's been my experience, and every place does it different, but it's just my experience is mayor will look around and say, is there a motion or motions to be made based upon the discussion that we've had? We've just concluded an executive session, and, and there maybe there will be nothing, because that's just the way the meeting went. The, the, the executives, or someone will say, well, I move that we raise John from, you know, from pay grade, you know, 5B, to 6C, and you know, and everybody votes, and you go on about the way, or you move to terminate John, or whatever the case may be, you know. So you're you're here, you're in the open, everybody that's present can see, and hear, and be heard on what's going on. Uh, we have people that have gotten in trouble because they didn't take any action when they came out. But people thought that they had, you know, something transpires. You, you. That's why you want to ask for motions. That even if you, even if you've come to, uh, you know, we've talked about it. We've talked about it, and you know, nothing's there. But we want to. We, you want to ask for a motion. Okay. Questions? Any questions on on that issue? Okay. Other questions. How long can executive session last? Well, there's no specified time, and we've, we've kind of talked about the, the time. Uh, the only thing really is you're limited by the time that you've specified in the motion, and we've talked about coming back in and extending that time and doing that, or, that, or waiting if you get done until the time has, has ran. My suggestion is usually because nobody likes to sit around and stare at each other. It, it's easier to say, well, okay, you know, we'll come back at 20 till. Well, at 20 till, you still need another 10 minutes. It's easier to come back in and, and do another 10 minute motion than it is to sit around and look at each other for 10 minutes and, and just let the clock burn. Because here's the other thing that happens people can get tripped up. You come out of executive session, you've got eight minutes to burn. You're standing around in the ante room or wherever, and, and all at once people start talking about what what was discussed or what was going on in the executive session, and you haven't called the meeting back order. You're in violation of the Open Meetings Act. Because you're, you're talking about the business of the body when the meeting hasn't been convened. So, you know, that and standing on the front steps after the meeting is over and talking are are places where you can get tripped up. You know, it's human nature. Yeah. You know. So confine your discussion to the to the football fishing and foolishness that I use as my standard warning about what you can talk about. Uh, should is executive session discussions remain confidential? Yes. Now the problem there is that you know Subjects that are discussed should not be discussed outside of the closed session. That's the reason for the closed session. The issue becomes you can't preclude someone on the council or a staff. Well, a staff member is a little bit different because you can you can hire and fire them, but you can't hire and fire 
elected officials. The, and you can't adopt an ordinance that makes it illegal because you can't preclude freedom of speech. Just because you're an elected official, you didn't leave your First Amendment rights hanging at home on the mantle when you came to City Hall. Uh, but they, those kind of discussions, you know, outside of the session, up and down Main Street, I, I don't know how many times I just said, well, it seems like, you know, Main Street knows before we get out of the meeting what, what we did. Well, somebody's saying something somewhere. And, and the problem there is that, you know, it, this, that kind of activity, in my mind, reflects adversely on the city and the individual who's doing that. It, it, to me, it, it, it's a breach of trust or respect, you know. Uh, and in some such situations, such as the attorney-client privilege, you may be waiving that privilege and, and the world gets to know what your legal strategy is in a lawsuit or something, and, and that's, that's why we have attorney-client privilege to avoid that, but it can be waived just simply by flapping your lips. Uh, now, you know, so those are reasons not to not to discuss what went on in the executive session up and down Main Street. You know, it, that the other thing is is that if you come out and you fire Joe, well, that's public record. We don't the, the simple response is, is that we don't talk about personnel matters. You know, it's, that's, that's, the, that's the response there. The other thing is, is that in some situations, uh, not probably many that the, city, that the city would cover, but you may, have, you may have some kind of breach of privacy issue that subjects you to some kind of civil liability, you know, if, where something's discussed in, in a meeting that comes along. Okay, we're going to talk, we've talked about how to avoid issues. Now what happens if if you do get caught? If something does happen? The enforcement. Well, the attorney general or the county or district attorney are charged by statute with the responsibility of enforcing the, uh, the act. Generally it's going to be the county or district attorney. The AG's office is going to pawn if, if if the complaining party calls the AG's office, AG is probably going to refer it to the county or district attorney simply because they're the ones at home that, sh that they feel that should be doing it. Now, on occasion, you know, there's a conflict. You know, in a small city, it's not, not unlikely that your city attorney could also be your county attorney, and that, that would preclude them doing it. And, and in that case, it, the, the AG's office would do the investigation. And, and make any recommendations and, and bring any action that could be filed in district court. What kind of uh, action can be can be done? Well, the the we'll talk about county attorney. They can seek an injunction, which is an order court order that prohibits you from taking action. In other words, if you you've been chronically violating the act. They can order that you not violate it, and if you do, then you're in contempt of court because you violated a court order. They can uh, enter an order of mandamus, which is an order that compels you to do something, give notice because you're required to do it by law. They can impose a civil penalty of $500 per violation, and that's a penalty upon the individual that's, that's been involved in that and not the city. Or they can avoid the action that's been taken. Now, to avoid the action, the the county attorney or the district attorney or the AG must initiate the violation within 21 days of its alleged occurrence, and that seldom occurs. But they could come in and and avoid the action that was taken under under that provision. Private individuals may also bring open meetings uh, enforcement actions, but they are limited only to injunction and mandamus orders. Now, usually what we find, for the most part, 
well, let me back up a minute. The, you, you can't claim that you're unaware of a violation or that you weren't aware that the law applied to you. Ignorance is not a defense in this environment. Uh, and generally, penalties will not be imposed for what's deemed to be a, a technical violation. Because the Open Meetings Act calls for penalties only when the meeting is not in substantial compliance with the Act. Now, usually where this might come into play is that if you have a motion to go to executive session, motion is to go to executive session under the, the uh, non-elected personnel exception, and you fail to put that little qualifier in there to discuss, you know, performance employee performance or something of that nature, that's a that's a generally considered to be a technical violation. And you you can get slapped on the wrist, you know, but seldom do you see any of the, the cash the, the penalties or any of that thing. Usually and, and that's sort of where we come in and how we get to this point where, where we're here tonight is that uh, is that someone, you realize after the fact, or someone brings it to your attention that you probably violated the Open Meetings Act in, in some way. Uh, you failed to get notice to everyone, or what, you know, something of that nature. And you, you city attorney, clerk, somebody calls us and said, we did or didn't do this, are we in trouble? And we say, well, usually we have to tell us more. <laughs> but say, yeah, you probably are. Our recommendation is, is that you self-report to the county attorney. The best way to do that is to have the city attorney write a letter to the county attorney and say, my counsel did blah, 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 blah. I believe that to be you know, a, a, a violation of the Open Meetings Act. And we propose to do da, 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 da. To, to rectify the situation. Usually, you know, what that ends up is kind of like where we are here is that is the reason is that county attorneys don't like to investigate these matters. They're, you know, they have a lot, they have bigger fish to fry and, and it, it makes no friends anywhere along the line regardless of how you, how it shakes out. Uh, attorneys a lot. Pardon me? But can't press association. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the thing is, is that you know they do have to be re they they have to be reported. Even though you self-report, it has to be reported to the AG's office because they they keep a, a log of, of potential violations and, and remedies and what's imposed. But if if you contact the city uh, the county attorney and you say, okay, we had what we believe to be a technical violation because we failed to do whatever uh, and. You know, we basically will enter into a cease and desist agreement with the county attorney and we agree to get training and it won't happen again. You know, most of them will, will jump at that opportunity. Now, we have people that are much more egregious than that, that they, they just don't really care. And those are the ones that you get to read a lot more about. Uh, I think I'm going to get to talk to one of those groups in the next couple of weeks where for, for three years the county attorney has been trying to get them to do something and they won't even talk to her. Uh, we'll, we'll wait to see what happens there. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it, it doesn't matter the size of the city. The city of Topeka got hammered on an open meetings violation where they, I don't remember if they agreed to not sell or to sell their city helicopter, basically standing around out in the hallway after while while they were on a on a break. <laughs> uh, that didn't fly well, no pun intended there, but but you know you you've got all kinds of legal counsel hanging around and it still happens and, and believe me that as as a former city attorney it just leaves you pounding your head on the wall says, we buy you people books and we buy you books and what do you do? You must just only eat the covers because we can't, <laughs> you continue to, 
to mess up. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, the enforcement then comes along in, in the form of injunction, mandamus, or civil penalties. It can impose court costs, attorney's fees, and as I said before, has validate the action that was taken. Can result in removal from office for the elected officials involved. Now, the well, the Meetings Act does not list removal from office as a penalty because that it comes in underneath the uh, the concept of ouster and recall. Ouster being an action initiated by the county attorney to re to remove an elected official from from office, a recall being an action initiated by the citizens on petition, and that results in if it's a valid petition with the requisite number of signatures and right ends up in an election, which basically is to remove you as opposed to elect you. And the reason that those come into play is that they. Each of them have an, one of the elements that's possible for ouster or recall is a violation of state law. And if you violate the Open Meetings Act, you're violating the state law. Now, you know, number one is that if county attorneys don't like to get involved in open meetings provisions, they're definitely not going to like getting involved in an ouster provision over, you know, a, a technical violation of the act. So, you know, minor falling off the wagons probably aren't going to get you in trouble. Continuing episodes will. Uh, let me back up then. Okay. Contrary to what some people think, no jail time comes about out of, out of the violation. Uh, Court costs can be assessed against the body, but not the individual members. So the city could be, they could be imposed. Uh, what a change in the law that allows the court costs to be assessed to the complaining party if the court finds that that person was making basically an absolute frivolous complaint and, and doing it without any reasonable basis to do it. Uh, you know, we, we see people talking to us about a lot of things that I would that that are technical violations but but there's reason to believe that that they you know that they were occurring. Uh, okay, we're about about to wrap up here and get to get to talk about the, the fun things on the, the test. Uh, some things to remember uh, resources you each have the best one, which is the Open Meetings Manual. Also, in the clerk's handbook, as I mentioned before, there's a version. There's a, you know, and, then, and in the governing body uh, handbook, there's also there. And on the Attorney General's website, they have a an open meeting summary and an outline and a variety. They have some frequently asked questions and, and this type of stuff that I. I that are a good place to go to. Now, before we go into reviewing the test, are there any questions? Yes, sir. I'd like to you talk a little bit about conflict of interest. Okay. Under Kansas law, conflict of interest only exists when you have a financial interest or a member of your immediate family has a financial interest in a business that you may be city may be contracting or doing business with that that business. So let's say that uh, you own a landscaping business and the city wants to landscape the park. Uh, you would be precluded from participating in the discussion and the action on that contract on that unless they had open bidding for it. If anybody that wants to do it can bid for it, then that you're not out of the out of the mix. Let's say that, uh, you know, do you, and let me ask: Do you have a specific 
factual situation rather than me kind of making things up. I'm just going to give you a scenario. Okay. I'm sitting on city council. It came in, goes in an executive session, and they talk about somebody giving you a piece of property or something. Can't do that. Can't go to executive session to do that. Really? Yeah. Executive session can only be used for the preliminary discussion of, well, I take that back, preliminary discussion of acquisition of property. Okay. So, yeah. I yeah. thought you could yeah. yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Okay, and in that, in that executive session meeting, we found out that the council or the body decided they weren't interested. Well, maybe one of them people that was in that executive session had heard that conversation, went and made an offer on the building that they were going to give the city. Well, Do I have a conflict here? Well, if the if the council came out and voted to not take action to accept the gift or whatever the case may be, to me, the city is out of the picture. Would they have to take a vote to not take action? Well, I, I, I guess the, the flip side of that is is if you come out and there's a request or there is there a motion or motions to be made and there's no action made, then there is I suppose you can say the assumption that the city chose not to not to do so. To me, that's a case where it's better to have a negative motion and do something so that you clarify not only with the people in the room and the people at the table, but also the people who were attempting to give you a gift that we decided not to buy it, not to take it, or not to buy it, or whatever the case may be. Uh, that's, you know, again, it's one of those things that uh, it's... Uh, you know, it, it, it is problematic regardless of how it's done because somewhere along the line somebody's going to say, well, you got a better deal because. And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. You know, who knows? And it's just one of those things that you, you know, the, the, the general philosophy is is that you, you don't want to use your elected position to, to benefit yourself or to appear to benefit yourself and that's why I say okay if the count if the council had done something to definitively state we're not interested then you know it would seem that you know anybody that was interested could go talk to the the people that were wanting to dispose of the property whether that included any or all of you in the room you know but uh, that's that's one of those Nice gray ones. Well, I, I just scenario. It yeah. happened to me, and I turned a bid in on it. Well, and then and I it, was told I had a conflict of interest, and I withdrawn my bid. Well, uh, okay. And here's my thought. If it's sort of like the scenario I gave you with the landscaping. Mm -hmm. If the property is being sold on, you know, auction or sealed bids or whatever. I don't know. To me, that changes the perplexion of it, the complexion of it, a little bit, simply because the the owner has made it known that I'm I'm soliciting offers. Whereas, if nobody knew it and you just walked over to him and said, "Hey, John, you know the city uh, the city's not interested. You know that, but I give you, you know, whatever for it," and he sells it to you. Then that, you know, that has a little different smell to it than than bidding on it at an auction or a sealed bid situation where you submit sealed bids. To me, that's that's my my take on it. Yeah, but that's me. Uh, any other questions before we get to the to the fun part of this, so that we can go on here for about another seven minutes or so and satisfy the. The, the county attorney's requirement that we get you two hours of training. <laughs> okay, you guys, I, I've either uh, covered it real well or I've got you so well snowed that you don't know where to go next. <laughs> I don't know which. Well, we'll we'll go through, we'll go through some of these questions uh, reasonably quickly here, uh, and I'll I'll be honest, uh, there are a couple trick questions in here. So. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, the Open Meetings Act number one. Open Meeting Act applies to city commissions, councils, committees, subcommittees, commissions, boards, etc. Formed by, formed by them. True. True. That that was okay. And this, statutorily, and I, I read you what the statute says on that. Uh, there being some exceptions, of course, to that. Uh, but we we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. One thing that I will give you that we we don't talk about too much is not-for-profits. In uh, 2005, there was an attempt to bring not-for-profits under the Open Meetings Act. And, and it related basically to an organization in Topeka that involved their economic development thing. Have to have to understand that Topeka is, is kind of a unique entity in and of itself, is that everyone hates each other and trusts no one. Uh, I, I tell people, I moved from Topeka in 1977, I returned in 2001. The only thing that had changed was the names and faces of people. They were still arguing about the same things that they were when I left in, two, in 1977. So, But anyway, be that as it may, I've slandered those folk enough. But anyway, the, the, the issue was is that they wanted to bring these kind of not-for-profits that received public funding under the Open Meetings Act. Uh, and really, uh, that ended up being resolved by a compromise to uh, require that any uh, not-for-profit that received more than $350 of funding uh, from, uh, in aggregate from a covered entity uh, to document the receipt and expenditure of those funds, and it became more of a, it became an open records issue. And the thing is, is that uh, you know if if the if the organization does not Segregate, segregate and document how they use it, then their entire records become subject to Open Records Act. So, and what this really means is that, uh, and I don't know if you have any organizations in town that you, you make a contribution to, uh, if you had a, I don't know if you got a chamber of commerce or a county chamber or something that you might make it, you, you should need, need to remind them that if you do that at least that element of their records are subject to to open records to keep them from being able to, the, now this doesn't mean and, and we're kind of deviating here a bit we're getting into a bit of open records but I want to clarify doesn't mean that that since you spend hundred fifty thousand dollars a year with a co-op to buy diesel and, and other things their records are open vendors records aren't open it's just the not-for-profits that you may make an, a contribution or or assistance payment Okay, number two. Under Open Meetings Act, a work session, retreat, study group, and executive board meeting are considered meetings. It's all true. It doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it a horse race, but it's still a meeting if you if you meet the the three the three prong test. Number three. When the Open Meeting Act applies to a meeting, the city must give notice of the meeting to those requesting notice, post notice of the meeting at at least four hours in advance, and conduct the meeting in the open. False. False, yeah. Because you, you're only required to conduct it in the open. Those other things, is you just have to give it to no, reasonable notice to the folks that have, that have requested notice. Number four. A meeting, as defined by the Open Meetings Act, requires that there is a prearranged meeting of a majority of a quorum of the body with interactive discussion of the business of the body and binding action is taken. I put as many false things in there as I possibly could. <laughs> yeah, because the, the current definition of the meeting does not require that the gathering be prearranged. The old definition, an older definition way back when did have that in it, incidentally. And no longer is it a majority of the quorum, it's a majority of the body elect, or the membership of the body, and the binding action is not required. Again, it's the three-pronged test. If you can remember those three things, you can say, whoa, this is, this is a road we don't want to travel. Number five, a, a past practice of giving notice when a notice has not been requested establishes an obligation to continue giving such notice. That's false. There's no, and I, I took that off of the AG site. So, uh, I you know it, that's one of those that you know. 
sometimes you find yourself in, in kind of a constructive notice situation where you've been giving notice and now you've quit giving it to somebody and they haven't, you know, but at least as far as the AG is concerned, that's, that's it, and the statute pre precisely says that it has to be to those who have requested it and not been interpreted to establish this type of requirement. Number six, the city council or commission is required to go to an executive session to discuss matters relating to personnel matters of non-elected employees. That's false. You're not required to. They have an exception so that you may. And, and this was one of those that was a bit of a, a trick question. I, I acknowledge that because statutorily permits cities to go to executive session for certain reasons, which include the non-elected personnel matters, but the use of the exceptions is discretionary. So you, any of the things that you can go to executive session for, you can discuss in open meetings, it may not be the best policy. When holding an executive session, the governing body may include anyone they believe will aid them in the discussion. This is true. Now, only the members of the body have the right to attend the executive session. And so you may discretionarily include anyone that you believe will aid in the discussion. We talked about the supervisor in a disciplinary matter or something along that line. Uh, certainly legal counsel in some situations and mandatorily in the attorney-client situation. Uh, you know, some cities routinely include the city, city attorney and city clerk in, in all executive sessions. Others don't. Uh, okay, number eight. Open Meetings Act requires that minutes be taken of the meeting. I wanted to give you one, one easy one. That's, that's false, for sure. Okay. Huh? I thought it, how was that false? Oh, the take of the meeting. I'm sorry. I misread the question. Yeah, you thought you were talking about Yeah, it requires, the co but the thing is, is that it does not require the taking of minutes at the meeting. Coleman does not address minutes in any way, shape, or form. So if you have a regular meeting, like tonight, mm -hmm. clerk's taking minutes, that's not under the Open Meetings Act. She's not required to take minutes under the Open Meetings Act. So that, that question is still false. Well, I misread it and <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it's required someplace. <laughs> yes. And because and, and here's an interesting just a side note. Statutorily there is no reference to minutes anywhere in the statute. Keeps record of and actions. actions. Yeah, or records yeah, maintains a record of the actions or records the act of the body and, and a variety of words of that way, which and, and a journal of actions, I think they even use that old term, uh, but we interpret it to mean minutes. Okay, number nine, a governing body may go to executive session under the personnel exception to discuss an employee review, okay. discuss the development of a salary matrix, yes, the reason for that, any, if you've got a question on whether or not it's a proper matter to go to executive session uh, non-elected personnel is that think of it in terms of specifically identifiable person or persons. If you're discussing something that it impacts all city employees such as a cost of living adjustment or adjusting the pay, pay raise or whether or not you're going to you know give dental coverage in your health package that does not fall under the exception. Okay, to review applications to hire a new city police officer. Right. To review the actions of an independent contractor. False. That is false. Now, there, there may be an exception here. If that, that discussion would lead you to talk about legal advice in some kind of recourse against the contractor, you know, the the pavement disappeared the first time it rained, you know, then you, then but then you're not using the the personnel exception. You would be using the attorney-client privilege exception. Okay, you guys are doing well. Number ten. 
Governing body may not use the attorney-client exception if the attorney is not present and participating in the discussion. Sure. I think we beat that horse to death earlier this evening, so <laughs> we'll go on down that road. Uh, now, I don't remember because I've I given portions of this presentation earlier today in, in, in Wichita and I can't remember who I've told what to uh, reach at that point in the evening. I think that in this day and age where we have the ability to electronically tie meetings together, that you know, if, if push came to shove, you could probably do attorney-client privilege with the attorney available via Skype face-to-face -face or something along that line, you know, that's a, that's, that constitutes a meeting for violation or, or, or whether or not the Open Meetings Act applies, so I don't know why it wouldn't in, in, that, in that rare case that, uh, you know. Telephone. Telephone problem. Council's outside of the state or someplace. Well, yeah, and we, we tell people, and, and really, that, you know, if you need, to, if you need a quorum, and, and you've got somebody that's laid up at home with a busted leg, you know, and they're not going to come out in the ice and snow. But it, you can set up your meeting via conference call, but it has to be such that everybody can hear and be heard, and the individual on the other end can't get up and wander off to someplace else uh, because you've lost your quorum. Now, I recommend if we do that, if you do that, that you establish some kind of written policy under so under what kind of terms and conditions, what kind of conditions that you can use it. We had a city a few years ago that had a snowbird for a council member, and they won. They were going to go to Florida from whenever the snowbirds move off until they come back. You know, the end of October to the first of March, and they wanted to to meet, and council told them, no, we can't. We can't have that. You know. You knew when you ran for office that you were expected to be here, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and so you know it, it caused a bit of a brouhaha but, uh, because they had done it before, not for not for a snowbird situation, but for other times when they needed to get somebody to the council meeting. You know, so I I suggest that you you do some kind of written policy as to when you would you would use it. You know, now that situation, let's say that. Uh, he was in Florida, and he was snowboarding, and you had a situation where you had to, you had a special meeting, or you had a meeting where you had to have a majority, a super majority, you had to have four instead of three votes to pass something. That might be reason enough to call up and get them on the phone. You know, you've got an extraordinary circumstances come about, but just to accommodate somebody that doesn't like Kansas winters, I have, you know, my, my degree of sympathy gets a little low, I guess, <laughs> from some standpoint. Okay, uh, let's see, where were we? Okay. Open Meeting Act requires that the covered body create an agenda for its meeting. We've talked about that. That's false. It doesn't require an agenda to be prepared. It simply requires that there, if there is one, that it be, that it, it be made available. Open Meetings Act may be enforced by the Attorney General, County, or District Attorneys, and by private citizens. True. Let me talk about that. Uh, okay, I, I've given away the answer to this one. A violation of the Open Meetings Act can result in jail time. I've already told you that that, that, that won't happen. No matter how much you might want it to happen, it won't happen. Uh, but as we did say, that removal from office can occur because of open meetings violation because you are in violation of state law and it, it's a grounds for ouster. There's a, there's a Kansas Supreme Court case to that effect. But really, and I'll add here kind of parenthetically, probably the most significant penalty that comes to a governing body that violates the Open Meeting Act, particularly if it's if it's egregious or it, or, or it just happens on a a number of little occasions is that there's there's a loss of public trust. We suffer from that anymore too much anyway. Though so, you know, just the just the investigation, the mere investigation, even if you're you're found not to have violated it, is 
you know, leaves leaves the citizens scratching their heads about well, what are these people really doing over here? We, we, you know, we try our darndest, all of us that have been in this business, to, to conduct our business in the open. You know, there's nothing, very little, nothing to be gained to, to do it behind closed doors. Okay, off the soapbox. Okay, number 14, a violation of, of the Open Meeting of Acts to discuss both things, to discuss both exempt and non-exempt subjects during an executive session. This is a trick question. This is one that I acknowledge is trick. Because uh, it can be answered either way, depending upon the facts of the matter. Uh, generally, this is true. However, the Kansas Court of Appeals has said that if segregation of the exempt and non-exempt topics would make a coherent discussion impossible, then it may be reasonable to discuss both exempt and non-exempt. This came out of a school board case, and I won't even begin to try to go through the factual basis because it's so convoluted. But it, it boiled down to uh, a couple school administrators, and who knew what when, and who did what when, and the, and the thing is, is that the discussion of, to discuss, to, to figure out whether or not they had a discipline action, they had to determine the who knew what when, and who did what when, and the Court of Appeals said, well, in that case, there was no way you could have sorted this out if you had to, had to segregate all of the things. So I'm going to say, while the, while the answer is either one, it's it's a, it's a unique situation. Uh, the last question is, a governing body may not hold a meeting in any location other than a normal meeting place. I think we talked about that earlier, but that, that's false. You can do it in any location that you so choose, so long as it, you, you're meeting the accessibility issues. So with that, folks, if you've got questions, I'd be happy to stick around and answer some for a bit. If not, thank you very much. And you're welcome. You. And uh, no. as always, uh